Hey everyone, Eric Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and a tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to another DM's Guild review, my written and video review series. Take a look at the adventures and supplemental material at the Dungeon Masters Guild website. This video will be reviewing the Monster Supplement Home Field Advantage, designed by Valentin Trekarus Prebo, Sean Vosterra, Terran Indestructible Boy Pounds, Boyan Valevin, Kirsty Kid, Django Games, Xavier Bates, Devil and DM, Enjoy Gaylord for Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition. This review has been sponsored by the publisher and review copy has been provided for the purposes of this review. If you are interested in a sponsored review, please reach out via email, Twitter, or Discord, or my submission form at roguewatson.com. If you enjoy the content, consider using my affiliate links for your online shopping and supporting me via patreon.com slash roguewatson. So starting with the monster manual and going on to like Mordenkainen's and Volo's Guide to Monsters, we have certain legendary creatures who are given uh, typically legendary actions and also layer actions. These are your uh, your dragons, your uh, beholders, um, Aboleth, Kraken, like just really top tier creatures to which their layer would be a big part of your experience. And the layer actions, in addition to legendary actions, uh, usually are triggered off initiative 20 and have some kind of neat environmental effect that kind of creates another uh, hazard and really pulls together the whole concept of a, of a exciting big boss fight. Uh, what home field advantage does is ask the question, why not unlock layer actions for all? <laughs> In this case, literally every single creature uh, that is an official 5e creature that includes from the Monster Manual, from Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, Tome of Foes, and Volo's Guide to Monsters. That is well over 200 different creatures who are given layer actions. And the result is pretty damn impressive because layer actions, not only are they all, it's very well written, they're very well designed, they are meticulously and thematically tied to all of their creatures in really fun ways. So it effectively not only makes those creatures um, more interesting in the context of a boss fight, but also doubles as being a really fun way to design dungeons and really give uh, the DM some really neat ideas and proper tools to craft dungeons surrounding certain creatures or layer is probably the best word to use because a layer is is essentially a smallish dungeon that is designed to be the home base of a certain creature and then they can have minions and things throughout there uh, i'm very very impressed with what this book has to offer it's gigantic because you don't get over you know 250 different uh creatures without having to list that many creatures it does not include the og stat blocks by the way it does this is very much an expansion or DLC, if you will, to having those original uh, Monster Manual books, because without those, this does you no good. So we have to assume that our consumer at least has the Monster Manual, which I think is fair to say. And if you also have Mordenkainen's and Volos, then this helps you even further. So it just adds all those, it adds all new layer actions for all of those creatures. And not even just the kind of obvious creatures like, uh, you know, a, a manticore, a medusa, a hydra, like creatures that you could see as being, okay, these are also monsters that could serve as bosses with neat layers and things. But it even includes lower level uh, creatures and stat blocks, like uh, like a dryad or a gargoyle, a nothic. These are all like CR2, a displacer beast, I think is like a CR4. You know, creatures that you wouldn't normally think of having necessarily their own layer are given uh, layer actions here, just in case you want to use them. Even more impressive are all of the mostly mundane NPC humanoid stat blocks that you would find at, you know, at the end of the Monster Manual. It has a bunch of them, which are probably one of the most commonly used stat blocks. We all like throwing monsters at our players, but a lot of times we're, you're, we're having to use guards and knights and mages and priests. And, you know, um, I think uh, Mordenkainen's added some new, you know, different specific kinds of mages and archers and all these different you know, more specific niches of humanoids. And this adds layer actions for all of those different kinds of creatures. Like even like a noble, which is like a CR 1-8, or townsfolk, literally townsfolk is given its own layer action in that the layer could be a town and maybe the players are being like run out of town or something. So you could mechanically create these layer actions. Um, which brings me to one of my uh, opening points is that 
the first couple pages does a really fun job of explaining, you know, what layer actions are, how to use them, but also these different variants of layer actions, which means you could have a horde layer. So for example, if there are a bunch of goblins or gnolls or zombies, uh, if you have a certain amount of them, then they create essentially a boss type situation. And you could um, also include layer actions for that one. You might want to make a central one like the linchpin, but otherwise, you know, as long as there's a certain amount of them, and then they can activate these layer actions to create a more satisfying uh, boss fight. Same thing with like overlapping or shared layers. So somebody could be both a noble and knight. So maybe they could pull from both of those layers. And then a shared layer, maybe if somebody is a, uh, a humanoid who has a mount, a monstrous mount, then you could use both of their layers or either one, you know, just, it lets you just unlock and, and, you know, overlap and use all these different things, as well as including player character layers, in case you want to do a reverse thing and have the players get invaded for their home base and then they, maybe they could use some layer actions as well. So a really fun little couple pages here uh, that kind of get into the weeds about how to create your own layers. This is way too many uh, creatures for me to fully go over in terms of page to page. There is uh, over 200 pages worth. But the I do want to flip through it for a second because the production value is really pretty nice. Now, I have complained in the past from other uh, supplements or books that I've reviewed which have used contrasting art styles and it didn't look too good. It was like it just didn't fit for me or didn't work and uh, the way they just clashed on the page didn't look very good. I actually think it works in favor here and I, I'm not even sure I can particularly articulate why. But I think there's just such a variety and the way they're inlaid in the page looks really nice. I love the fact that we don't just pull a bunch of stock art of the creatures in here, although there is that, which is fine. That's what stock art is for. But there's actually a nice variety. So like this is a great example of a page. You've got like a page, a, a, a full color picture of a basilisk. Then you've got a, this crazy cool looking like a black and white, you know, shaded sketch drawing of a like dragon born bard maybe uh and then in the background here beneath the basilisk you've got this kind of dyson logos uh it is actually dyson logos has the name right there um uh map like dungeon map in the back because again these are all layers so that's really nice to where all these pages they really jump out in terms of how the art is used and i love that we get a lot of actual like battle maps some of them even a little bit of grid maps although I did reach out to the the designers and they didn't actually include any of these as like separate maps. They just had um, the rights to essentially show them to you, not necessarily distribute them. So it kind of works as a tease. Thankfully, it does include uh, Patreons. I believe it's uh, is that Christian Zoish's uh, art style um, that does the uh, this, this battle map style that I really enjoy. But uh, definitely, I think that's a great teaser for that. I, it's all pro, basically. I'm, I'm super uh, thumbs up on the actual production value and the way that every single page has, you know, some color and some art and just really pops out of the page. The whole thing is an absolute joy to look at. It's not, it doesn't have the original art and the amazing mind blowing stuff that Monster Manual Expanded 3 does, but because there are no new monsters here, I think it goes well above and beyond what I would consider, it, which is a you know, a, a modular, an add-on, a DLC to existing monster content and still makes it really fun to read. All right, but what really matters are the actual layers. So I've, I kind of gonna pull, you know, pick and choose some because it's literally gonna be impossible for me to just kind of flip through here. So the Archer is a great example of a humanoid that you wouldn't normally even think about being a layer, you know, monster, layer creature for lack of a better term. But I think it actually does a pretty good job of explaining how that could happen. And I love the little paragraph blurbs that all of the creatures are given. It's it's ex extremely well written in such a small little paragraph. Uh, I'm just going to read the archer. Though they spend most missions out and about, when archers do settle down and form a lair, it is usually in a castle they are tasked with defending or abandoned camp that they are the captain of. A skilled archer will use the features of the terrain and prepare some equipment it can use to its advantage in a pinch. The only thing I would argue with is the use of it. I think it's really weird when you're discussing like humans, probably use they. Um, but I, I, I just love the way that paints a picture of like, oh yeah, I guess you could use an archer in a layer and, and here's like examples of where its layer could be. I just said it's <laughs> what their layer could be. Um, and here's examples of some layer actions. Uh, they could throw a smoke bomb 
at their feet and thus be able to disappear. Classic like ninja smoke bomb and even mentions the archer knows the layer like the back of their hand and can escape and get around. Also shoot a grappling arrow so you can even mobilize and gain like a climbing speed really quickly. You can shoot a fire arrow at a flask of oil on the ground to create this little explosion or fire an arrow at an alarm bell and thus summon in reinforcements, which is a very effective layer action that could add minions to this fight. Those are examples of really, really thematically appropriate because they all involve the archer like using um, a, a tool or firing, you know, a weapon. It doesn't, none of that feels very tacked on. It feels all very natural as part of the archer's uh, natural tool set or abilities that they would have, which I think is really, really cool. Now that's an example of a low level uh, creature. We're going to skip ahead to... Let's do the Death Knight at 35, which is a CR-17 uh, from the Monster Manual. The Death Knight is a warlord that commands, you know, armies of undead, and uh, his camp could be in a, uh, it says, a, a pregnable keep in the Shadowfell, a war camp at the center of a necromancer's army, or the site of an ambush in the ancient ruins of a holy city. And the layer actions include skeletal hands bursting out of the ground to try to restrain um, a, a, his enemies, or he could command a undead ally to sacrifice itself so that the Death Knight could then heal uh, with, by drawing the necromantic energy. It reminds me of like Arthas in uh, Warcraft, where you could cast the, the Death Quail to either harm enemies or, uh, or, or to, to uh, harm enemies or cast it on an ally that would then destroy it and heal, I believe, himself with it. You could also unleash waves of necromantic energy to pull uh, enemies uh, to or from him, so he's manipulating his just force of will. Those are all very, very cool. You know, and a lot of these pictures, yes, I've seen them before, a lot of it's stock art, but it works. It works to fill out the page, uh, and I appreciate that it's just bombarded with art left and right, because if you just had the layer actions, it would probably be half as big as it is, but I think it's, having all that art makes it a real joy uh, to look through. Ooh, here's a good one to point out. The I don't know if I pronounced this correctly. The Naufishni. Naufishni. <laughs> it's like I'm just going to hack and cough or sneeze, uh, which is like a, a gluttonous demon, um, which has a whole thing about a grotesque feast. So uh, literally like the, the sin of gluttony, I guess, in a lot of ways. And here's what's really clever. It, it mentions the fact that the lair contains tables, chairs, rusted cutlery, which hangs from the walls. And essentially you're creating this like twisted dining room or dining hall. And thus the lair actions are actually um, assume you have all that in place and include all that stuff, which I think is, is a good idea because that inspires me to then craft a dungeon like that, you know, to, or at least do the boss room like that. The actual final boss room where you would encounter this creature has all these various trippings and then you can feature all of those, um, you know, little parts of the environment as the layer action. So in this case, a lid flies off a serving tray, revealing a severed human head with an apple in its mouth. And the demon can, or it, it frightens enemies first with a wisdom save, and then the demon can actually uh, use an attack to eat the head, and that allows it to gain temporary hit points. Um, silverware flies off the walls and kind of appears in his claws and becomes like Wolverine, where he gains these like rusty silverware claws he can use, or he can just animate all these uh, objects around uh, the dining hall and turn this into a really twisted version of Be Our Guest from Beauty and the Beast. That's all very thematic and cool. And really speaks to the fact that the designers know, A, how to make layer actions, which is using the creature's uh, environment, but also thematically tying that environment to the creature. Another good example is the uh, the Achyug, which is, I actually have to go to a page for this one, 177. So Achyugs are these filthy, weird, three-legged, just gross, ravenous, tentacle just mouth creatures that tend to hang out in like garbage piles and sewers and just other nasty places. So the layer is obviously one of those nasty places and the layer actions all assume you're going to use that. So a layer action could be a wave of filth that splashes over a bunch of people and that can poison them and knock them prone. Uh, swarms of insects just pour out of the, you know, garbage nasty area and are basically attack any creatures or uh, the Achio can actually hide under these just pools of filth and then kind of travel under it and then pop up and appear. All of these things are really great, like, video game boss designs, too. Like, a boss can, you know, it's not just going to sit there and hit you. It's going to do different things. It's going to move around the battlefield. It's going to 
you know, employ all these different uh, things in its environment in really fun ways. And I, that it really makes me excited to run a lot of these creatures that I wouldn't normally uh, even necessarily consider to be big boss fights as boss fights just just by you even if you don't use legendary actions you could have these layer actions really add the fact that you can add the environment instead of just being like oh well you know the muck is difficult terrain so it's double movement and that's and then you've got this creature there no it's like the creature actually can do all these different things to manipulate the environment and the fact that you can put it on initiative 20 uh helps me as someone who easily becomes overwhelmed with running combat with everything going on and the players having to make all these different choices and things and that makes it organized so that I can see, okay, here, you know, at, at initiative 20 is when I'm going to employ one of these things every single round. And that's a great way of keeping up with it. So I'm, as somebody who really hasn't used layer actions for anything, for the reason because it's in hardly any creatures, right? Like, if you just run by the book, how often do you fight um, adult or ancient dragons? How often are you fighting a lich or a beholder? Like, you know handful of times in a campaign if at all and that's if campaigns usually make it into you know tier three and tier four and a lot of D D isn't ever reaching that point so i love the fact that we're using this system and mechanic which is there in the book but just isn't used until much later and now we can pull it and use it much earlier with creatures that can have a lot of fun with it the ghost is another great example page 105 which pulls together a lot of classic horror tropes so the ghost can cause um, ectoplasmic slime to leak out of somebody's body and stuns them. Uh, it can go full poltergeist and just have a bunch of, you know, doors and windows slam open and shut and knock people around with whatever bludgeoning objects and knock them down. Or it can just, you know, raise the tension level and create this chill, dreadful presence around that actually causes uh, you to have vulnerability to necrotic and psychic damage, which is a pretty big deal and a great one-two punch for its built-in attacks really really fun um the mage you know includes all these different stat blocks from volo's guide to monsters now because the original just had i believe the classic cr6 mage and you had the uh cr12 arch mage and then volo's added a whole bunch of new specific mages and this one says a few times when there's creatures that are very much overlapping they they do use the same layer, but in this case, like for the mage, we get a full like what is this over a dozen different things that mages could prepare and use as layer actions, whether that's glyphs or you know anti gravity rooms or um, you have to make special checks just to cast spells or maybe they summon uh, animated armors or regain um, all these different spell slots. You know you can just play around with it and as you know because they're all going to use the mage towers. What it's saying it's like hey the layer is the same. The mages could change, but the layer is always going to be the same, and they're always going to use these different um, tower options. So really, really cool. I mean that's over a few more. Um, let's look at the. Oh, I thought the flame skull was funny as hell because a flame skull is a very fun creature to use, especially against newbie players, uh, because it's one of the first creatures that the players will encounter that can cast fireball. I think it only gets one use of fireball. And in other words, it doesn't seem like a very powerful creature. It's this little skull that flies, and but it's a spell caster, and it's one of the first like dangerous spell casters that players could deal with. And two of its layer abilities, one of them is a like gravity rune that pulls everybody together, which is a great setup for fireball. And the other one is flammable gas that can leak out and uh, it's uh, becomes it, 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 sorry, it becomes uh, ignited if exposed to fire and then they take additional fire damage, which obviously is another great setup for fireball. So I just love the fact that the designer realized that flame skull be fireballing. Uh, and that's what you're going to be doing. And then it's layer action can just set that up to make it just absolutely devastatingly powerful, which is just fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, nothing but praise. I have nothing but praise for this. I can't go over like every single one of these, but suffice to say that I was really impressed specifically with just how thematically satisfying all of these uh, different layer actions were how much they gave me some fun ideas to use creatures which I wouldn't normally use but also how much fun it was to think of how to design dungeons for those creatures and and boss arenas in the one hand and then entire dungeons in the other because I think that the whole dungeon could be a tease for the actual boss arena uh, and it just makes me think of like cool monster hunter fights or something where the the cool monster um, you know retreats to its home base of a layer so if it's a fire you know, based creature, it's going to go to a fire uh, layer or something, or if it's a 
I don't know, a wind dragon. It's going to be on the top of a mountain or something. Um, you know, a, a guy who can jump to different trees, he's going to have these giant towering trees. You know, it's just going to take advantage of the environment where you're going to fight him, and that really ups the it ups the difficulty level, but also ups the tension in really fun ways. You can show off that creature uh, in in interesting ways for your players throughout all tiers of play, which I love the fact that this uh, decouples the layer actions from those top tier creatures and instead unlocks it for everybody and we all get to take advantage of using layer actions. All right, let's go over my pros and cons for home field advantage. Pros, over 250 new highly thematic layer actions for creatures from the Monster Manual, Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, and Volo's Guide to Monsters. The sheer quantity of it is absolutely mind-boggling, but to go into my next pro, I was very impressed with the quality, which is excellent layer actions that can double as dungeon design tips for every single monster. It really did uh, inspire me to think of how to craft these dungeons and uh, make them more thematically appropriate for their monsters and also those boss arenas and how to get the most out of these monsters and be able to just use layer actions for lower level, lower level or more common monsters or ones that you would not even think to use layer actions at all for, like you know, the knight or the mage or the guard or whatever, the archer, you know, the humanoids, you could have their own layers. Boss monsters, essentially, just create anybody can become a boss monster. Uh, custom, a pro, custom layer tips and variants, including horde layers, overlapping layers, and even player character layers. I honestly, that this first couple uh, little bit, I guess it's not a chat, it's an introduction, could be a little bit longer. I think it's a great breakdown of how to do layers, how to make custom layers, and how to get the most out of those. Uh, before we even get to the actual built-in layers. And then pro, the entire production design of things. Nice is nice variety of art styles, images, including creatures, images, and uh, environments and battle maps. Um, no, we don't get actual separate cool battle map layers, but that's going above and beyond. So I don't have any cons included here. I thought, you know, it, it would have been nice to have those maps available, but the fact that we get any maps at all is a huge bonus. So that's just a pro for me. Um, you know, maybe another, uh, you can make a whole other supplement that's like, hey, here's, you know, appropriate layer actual maps for these creatures that could then tie into this home field advantage. But otherwise, it's nothing but thumbs up. It's just really an impressive, complete package and absolutely delightful to be able to get excited about a lot of monsters that I haven't really, uh, you know, thought too much about. Final verdict, home field advantage deserves a coveted place up next to Monster Manual Expanded as a good-looking, well-designed, and incredibly useful monster supplement and a must-have for every Dungeon Master. Thank you to everyone for watching this video review. You can see my written, written review at roguewanson.com. You can watch more reviews and follow our own D&D adventures here on my YouTube channel and support my work at patreon.com slash roguewanson. Thank you.